everyone, and welcome back to the Assistant Room podcast. At whatever stage you are at in your career within the support industry, whether you are just starting out and are still finding your feet, or if you're more experienced and are juggling board meetings with demanding execs and a to-do list as long as your arm, I hope you are all well and having a great week. If we haven't met before, or if you're only just joining us, I'm Jess, founder of online PA lifestyle and membership platform, The Assistant Room. In the final episode of season one of the Assistant Room podcast, Karina and I sit down and we talk about her journey from having a bachelor's degree at the University of Warwick in philosophy, all the way through to her current job as an EA at FTI Consulting, and how she has managed to be able to come out the other side of a major life event throughout the COVID-19 pandemic, whilst keeping her head above the water in a successful career. Well, welcome. Thank you. I'm so excited that we're here. This is a really, really lovely thing that we get to do. It's a bit different to everything else, which is obviously makes it even nicer. But should we just go straight into it? I think and so. Yeah, yeah. I'm excited. We're ready. We're ready. <laughs> We've got this. <laughs> so, Karina Deborn, you officially graduated uni in 2016 with a bachelor's degree in philosophy, which sounds absolutely wonderful. <laughs> it sounds really fancy. From the University of Warwick. And you've spent the last two years at FTI. I know that you were somewhere else for a little bit before FTI Consulting. Yeah. But you've been there now for two years yep. as an executive assistant. And from... You know, you doing your degree to where you are now, that's a big change. I mean, yeah. a philosophy degree does not immediately scream to me, executive assistant. <laughs> so how did you become an EA in London? And was that always your plan? Or was there something else you thought you were going to do? And this yeah. just sort of happened? I think it's definitely safe to say this just sort of happened. I didn't really have a specific plan other than I knew... I'd want to be in London, I'd want to work, live in London once I graduated. But specifically what I wanted to do, just had no idea. As, like you said, philosophy doesn't necessarily lend itself to something specific or, you know, a specific career or anything like that. It's one of those transferable skills, yeah. life skills, you know. Like with most degrees, right? Yeah, Unless exactly. you're training to be a lawyer or a doctor. Yeah. I mean, I never went to university, but I can imagine you kind of leave thinking, okay, well, what do I do now? Yeah, precisely. And it was very much a case of unless you knew what you wanted to do, you, you know, yeah, be a lawyer or go into accounting or be an economist. It's quite a big, big space yeah. of what is there that I could possibly be doing. So I fell into doing a recruitment role, which a lot of grads, I think, just end up doing because anyone can kind of do it, learn the skills. It's a case of you've got to really have the drive to do well at it, which wasn't really what I wanted to do. But what I learned from that was that I really enjoyed the operational side of things, the organising side, the being the kind of go-to person that knew what was going on yeah. with everyone in the office and the admin organising, just calendar management, all that kind of thing, I was like, actually, this is what I actually quite enjoyed. I think I'd be good at. And through recruitment, we were obviously liaising with a lot of EAs, PAs. So I was kind of getting a vibe of, they seem like they know what they're doing. This seems like I could do that. That seems pretty decent job. And FTI is one of the clients that we worked with in my recruitment role. So I knew about them. I kind of knew how the company worked. Mm -hmm. I knew they had quite a good reputation. And a job ended up kind of coming up and I thought, you know what, actually, I think that might be a better move. I think that could be a better use of my time, my skills, and actually I might really enjoy it. So kind of threw myself into it and here we are. Here you are. That sounds like quite a a nice progression as well from where you were to FDI because they were a client. Yeah. I mean, what was that process like? Did you have a foot in the door already or...? So... The part of FTI I work in is a different part from which was our client. But because when I then interviewed, I knew the kind of work that FTI did. I knew kind of the way that their clients worked. I knew that they had a high bar when they were hiring kind of the billable side of things. So I already just had a good view of them, which I think came across well in interviews as they said, you know, we've spoken to a lot of people and they've never really heard of us or they, you know, just kind of know us as a competitor to big four, but don't know how we're different. But because I'd been selling them, as a, you know, go work for FTI, I knew 
what their pros were. I knew how they could be helping people in their career. So I think yeah. it just kind of, yeah, gave, gave me not exactly a foot in the door, but maybe more a, the door was a lot more open. It was, you had more insight, maybe. Yeah, exactly. Else. Fun fact, I actually tempted at FTI. Really? When I was a PA. <gasps> yeah, so there was a lady called Lucy who was going on, I think she was going away for her honeymoon. And obviously she was getting married and, and she needed time off. And I yeah. think I was only there for about two or three weeks. But I absolutely loved it. The offices are gorgeous. The canteen's yeah. brilliant. <laughs> the canteen is good. The canteen is good. <laughs> it was lovely, though. It has such a nice vibe. It does. It does have a lovely vibe. And all the other EAs in the team I work with, they were so welcoming and it just felt more like this is actually what I should be doing. This is a much better move. And like you said, it was a good progression. Yeah. It was taking me away from what I didn't like in recruitment, but right into the thick of that operational side of things, which I thought, I, I think I could do this. Yeah. So what, what do you do at FDI? So tell us a bit more about who you look after and what you kind of do on a day to day basis. So I look after about 10 different people, all from the kind of, not the high, the most senior people, but the one below that to about the mid-level okay, seniority, yeah. I would say. And it really depends on exactly who you're looking after. And it can be completely different every single day, which I'm sure everyone always says about their job. But a big part of what I do is the segment I'm in is split into four smaller segments and I look after the second biggest one. So I have a big involvement in helping the whole team in terms of socials, being that go-to person for any mm -hmm. possible questions about how do they do their expenses, how do we start setting up interviews for new joiners, like how are we going to run the graduate process. So there's a lot of not necessarily things that relate to one executive, but there's yeah. a lot of broader practice-wide things that I do. Alongside, obviously, in normal times, it would have been a lot of travel, a lot of booking client dinners, yeah. a lot of business development, organisation side of things, and a lot of socials. And one other big thing I'd normally would be organising would be our corporate away day, but obviously that's things not happening changed, yeah. currently. But that's a big element of what I do as well. Yeah. Talking about corporate away days, I spoke to one of our A-lister members the other day. And obviously part of being an A-lister means that you get to have mentoring time and you get to have planning time and goal yeah. setting time directly with me. And she was telling me about how one of the, I think it was the EA to the chairman, she's organising uh, obviously a virtual exec away day. Yeah. And technically they should be going to, I think it's Nigeria and Ghana. Oh, wow. And they've made it all virtual. Oh, and really? It, it, I've, I've said to her, you have to tell me how it goes because they're going to be having, obviously everyone's at their own homes. They're yeah. not going to Ghana. They're not going to Nigeria. But they are going to have somebody with a camera obviously giving them a virtual tour really? of the areas that they would normally go to in Nigeria and Ghana. And I find oh. it so interesting. I think it really kind of shows the ability that we all have to adapt really well to these sorts of situations. Yeah. Because I think before COVID, if you had said to any of us that we would be in this situation, we yep. probably would have looked at you and thought, oh my God, don't be ridiculous. Exactly. But everyone's coped, all things considering, really well. Yeah, really well. Like our team, everything went virtual so quickly and we were so quick to make sure there were like virtual coffees or virtual socials or things going so quickly so that everyone still felt involved and in touch with one another and they had yeah. contact points which I think was so good and FTI you know before lockdown fully happened was good with saying if you want to be at home go home like work from home like we'll support that which I think has been really good for a lot of people especially there's been a lot of you know life changes for a lot of people that I'm aware of and I think that was a good easing you in as well like yes everything else is going on horrendous in the country but we're happy to just get everyone work from home, we'll go virtual, we'll change the way that we're going to do socials and meetings, which I think has been made it a lot easier. Yeah, yeah, it makes that transition a lot easier yeah. for everybody, doesn't exactly. it? Especially when everybody is so, you know, worried about what's going to happen and not knowing what's going to happen in the future. So, yeah, exactly. And obviously that's not going to disappear anytime soon. But, I mean, I know that obviously you are a really big supporter and a really big believer of using the lessons that you've learned from past experiences that may not be 
deemed as 100% relevant to being yeah. a PA or an EA or lend themselves to kind of developing you in your own yeah. career as a support professional. So how have you been able to take your own personal experiences that may not be related to being a, an EA yeah. and actually implement those at FTI within your role? So I think because, as I said before, I kind of just fell into the role and I knew I liked the operational side of things, but I knew I wanted to just be doing something a bit more and doing other things other than just the literal kind of day-to-day -day support side of things. So I really pushed myself to be that person that could know everything going on in the wider business sense. And I've thought from my previous jobs that it's good to be working on other things and just throw yourself into everything possible. I was promoted after about six months and went on this training and I was the only non-billable member of staff on this training. And I spoke to the internal person running this training and said, why uh, EAs, PAs, why are we not getting this level of training? I appreciate I'm here, but... No one else was here. When I got invited, everyone thought it was an error. We yeah. all thought it was an, oh my you know, God. a clerical error, error yeah, oh that I was on this training. And What was the training for? It was just like, they're called milestone training. So it's all the kind of internal level training, but it was kind of geared towards the billable staff. And I yeah. was just kind of there because I'd been promoted as well. But no other EAs had ever done any training like this at all. So... I was working with, her name's Heidi, so she heads up our learning and development at FTI. And I said to her, this is something we should be doing, aside from the fact that everyone needs training to keep you know, their skills up, improve their job, improve what they're doing. I think from a morale point of view, mm. all the EAs, the non believable staff, we always just feel a bit like, oh, well, no one really cares what we're doing or how yeah. we're feeling. And something like this would really help push us. And I've known... For my in my recruitment job, I felt so undervalued so much of the time when I was doing things that weren't necessarily relevant to what I had to do. I was just going the extra mile. Because yeah, that's just kind of what I would do myself, and no one ever really like thanked you or appreciated what you were doing. And I feel like that happens a lot in the EA world that we're not really appreciated for the full amount of what we do. You know, as soon as we're not there, I think a lot of things can kind of fall apart. Or yeah, one hundred percent everyone drops the ball I know but I think we're such a pivotal part of making sure a lot of things happen so I knew that if I pushed to have some sort of EA focused development program that would help a lot of people at least in our London office to just feel a bit more appreciated and like they want us there and they do know that we do a lot of hard work so that's a big thing that I've been pushing for over the last kind of 12 to 18 months mm -hmm. or so and I know when I've spoken about it for other people they've said actually yeah that's that is something we need because there's not a good career path in terms of what the next steps are once you get so far or what training we can have or you know we allow training can we do external things you know it's a big kind of gray area and where we sit on yeah. that side of things so that's definitely something that I think I've really pushed for and I think would be really good to have and that if I hadn't had my experiences of feeling underappreciated, I probably would have just thought, oh, well, there's no point me asking. Like, it's just how things are. But I just didn't want to accept that that is the norms. It just didn't feel right. No, and I think so many PAs and EAs and support professionals at any level feel exactly the same, don't they? I mean, we're today recording the last four episodes of Series yeah. 1 of the Assistant Room podcast. And we've obviously had to push it back because of COVID. And yeah. now we're obviously in the studio and we're getting all four done in one day. <laughs> and it's really lovely because everybody has spoken about the importance of learning and development and the importance that it plays in everybody's role going forward. I think that especially now, Knowing that you've got that additional support from your business is so important because really everybody's self-esteem is at rock bottom. No one knows what's going to be happening in the next six months. Job security is not something that everybody has anymore. So to be able to walk into your office when people do go back to their office or just interact with their teams 
virtually and know that the company has invested interest in who you are as an individual, even if you have to ask for it, you have to ask for it for them to be able to give you that opportunity. Of course. But to know that that is something that is on everybody's mind right now, it makes me really happy because as yeah. you know, I'm a massive advocate for learning and development and people constantly, you know, pushing themselves and pushing themselves and pushing themselves. But it also comes down to a confidence thing. Yeah, 100%. And I think having the confidence to say, I think we need a bit more support just in terms of that, give us a bit more learning development or at least point us to what you think could be useful or give us the time of day to say what we think could be useful and interesting for us. Otherwise, I think everyone, like you said, morale is low, everyone's worried, you know, are we going to still be working the same? Is my job still even going to be that job there in six months time if everything's gone virtual and a lot of things just kind of aren't happening anymore so I think having something that really boosts you is so important yeah and the way I would come at it as well is that it's value for value so people I don't think uh, anymore are going to be valued just based on their salary or their job title. I think from a PAEA perspective, we add a lot of value to businesses. We add a lot of value to our execs. As you said, you know, if we weren't there, a lot of things probably would go very wrong very quickly. (laughs) So it's about making your execs and your bosses understand that it's value for value. I give you this, I need this in return. And it's an exchange. It's a partnership. It's a business relationship. I mean, it's a requirement, isn't it, that you put yourself second to be able to do the job well. Yeah. And it's the reason why we're all, you know, employed to make things easier, more efficient, more effective for the people that we work with. There needs to be a bit of give and take. And if that means that you want to have the opportunity to develop yourself, develop your career, then you should be brave enough to ask for that. Yeah. 100%. And I couldn't advocate more for if you think you need something just go and ask for it because there's nothing wrong with asking. If the worst comes to worst, they say, no, or we're not sure what's going on in the next couple of months. At least you've asked, you've planted the seed and you can keep pushing for it. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Well, look, we obviously had a really good brief before this conversation and we wanted to talk about not just the business side of your life, but also your personal side of life. And this is an experience that we both share and we've shared going through COVID. But we wanted to talk about how, you know, when you are going through a very all-consuming personal issue, how that can very much affect your business life and how as PAs as well you know we're expected to leave everything at the front door oh yeah emotions wise you know we're not seen to be people who should be emotional at work no not at all And as I said, you know, both of us, we've been through a very similar situation during COVID-19. Our long-term relationships came to an end. We have both had to leave the home that we had before COVID-19. And we've both had to make huge adjustments, especially when everything is so uncertain. It just adds that extra pressure, doesn't it? Oh, I kind of feel like I had the rug ripped out from under my feet. Yeah, exactly how I felt. Yeah. And, And it's been really hard. So how have you been able to cope with your day job combined with this recent change to your personal life as well? I think one of the things that's really helped me get through is just being honest with the people I work with, or at least the ones I'm closest with. And, you know, when things went really bad right at the start of lockdown, I had a conversation with my the two main executives I look after. And I said, look, I'm going through this. I'm I'm not entirely sure why I'm going to be living at the moment. I honestly have no idea what's going on with many things, which I know a lot of people aren't. But I think I'm going to need a bit of time over at least the next couple of weeks to kind of sort myself out. This is the situation and I just hope you appreciate this. I'm not saying I need to fully take some time off because I... I still wanted to work. I still wanted something to be taking my mind off of everything. But I just asked them to be kind of patient with how I was going through everything and just said, you know, I might not get back to you on the same day or might be a bit slower to do things because I'm adjusting to a massive change that I wasn't expecting. And I had similar conversations with the other EAs as well and just said, again, this is my situation. Just please be patient with me. Like maybe I'm not yeah. going to be as on things as I normally would, but I'll get to it. It will happen. And I think just knowing that they 
were aware of the situation made it a lot easier. You know, if, if I didn't answer calls straight away or I didn't get back to emails on that same day, they knew, you know, I was probably dealing with things or I just needed kind of an afternoon just to myself to sort things yeah. out or just, you know, to kind of sit with what was happening. I think that really helped. And FDI were so good in terms of, as I said before, their flexibility in terms of if we wanted to work from home before lockdown happened, we could. So I was actually meant to go on holiday, then didn't, and just worked from home. And I said, you know, look, I'm not going to come in from the office, but I'll work instead. I won't take the time off. I'll just work. And they were just so good with saying, do whatever you need to do. Like, we appreciate this. We've all been through it at some point in our lives. We know it's difficult and everything else is making it even worse. So just do what you need to do. And I think if I hadn't been that upfront about it, it would have been a lot harder. And I think if it had come down to me saying, look, I went through this like three months ago, they would have been, well, why didn't you say anything? Like, why have you just kind of yeah. struggled on and not told us? Like, you've probably made that so much worse. Like, we would have understood. We are humans. We might all be you know, generally male and not as in tune with your emotions as you are. But we can appreciate if you're having a hard time, like that's absolutely fine. So I think that was the biggest. Yeah. And everyone goes, me. as you said, everyone goes through personal problems and personal issues, exactly. don't they? And uh, I mean, there are so many PAs and EAs who have done exactly the opposite. People that I've spoken to and they've, you know, they've said, oh, you know, I've got this going on and they've done exactly the opposite to what you did. And they haven't communicated it to work and they haven't communicated it to the business. And they are still having the same expectations put on them in comparison to what they were before. But the difference is that they're going through a massive, massive, massive personal problem. Yeah. And when it comes to being a PA or an EA, you have to be on the ball as much as possible to feel, I think, for people to feel as though they are being productive enough. Yeah. And I think that's a really big problem within our industry. It's about we always get worried about not doing enough. Yeah. Not making things as efficient as possible, yeah. dropping the ball occasionally, beating ourselves up if we make a tiny, tiny mistake. So having that open communication with your boss and your business is so important because otherwise you might get some negative feedback about something. And if you're already <laughs> feeling yeah. really low, that could be the thing that just tips you over the edge. Exactly. And I think it meant, you know, it didn't get to the point where, it was a few months down the line and maybe a few things had slipped or I'd been a bit blunt or I just didn't answer calls or whatever. They knew there was something going on. It wasn't such a case that they had to suddenly be, okay, like you've not been doing your job as brilliantly as you normally would or whatever. What's going on? Like, this isn't great. You need to fix this. You know, we didn't then need to have that awkward conversation, which, as you said, is going to make you feel even worse because they knew there were other things going on. It wasn't like I was just, oh, I just can't be bothered today. You know, it was, no, actually, I need to deal with things. I just, I can't face being on a call. I can't face talking to anyone. Yeah. Which made it a lot easier. Yeah. And if you're not in a position where you feel comfortable to tell your boss in person, face to face or over the phone, or if you don't feel like you've got a strong enough relationship with them, if they've you know, if you've recently started a new role, you can always email them. Oh, yeah. I've sent loads of emails to my boss over the last couple of months just being like, I can't face doing calls today or I'm just having a really difficult week. Like, and a lot of them have been literally pretty just blunt and to the point, but he's just been, okay, fine, do what you need to do. Like they know things can be difficult yeah. and that if you're being honest with that you're having a hard time, I think they'll appreciate that more because they'll feel like, Actually, we're having more of a kind of human connection, not just, oh, it's just my PA, she's having a bad day. You know, I think they appreciate that you're trying to tell them something's happening, yeah. which is good. And credibility is a huge part to play, doesn't it? It has oh, a huge course. part to play in, in how successful you are in any kind of role. And to be open and to admit that you're struggling, a yeah. lot of people would find that in itself one, very scary, but also, two, there's this mindset if you tell your boss that you're struggling, that they're going to think you're not a good PA. Yeah. And that is the opposite. Like, I think the general message is we're all human, yeah, right? So exactly. we all go through things. I mean, 
I know when I was going through my situation, obviously you're one of our ambassadors and I very openly said to you guys, look, I'm not going to be around for the next week. I just need to take some time by myself. And I think if I hadn't done that, I just would have driven myself mad. I remember you sending that message and we were all just, yes, obviously, take some time. Like you don't need to apologise for that. That's If that's what you need to do, that's what you need to do. You shouldn't feel bad about that being the case. You know, we all, as you said, we all have difficult times. We all have to deal with them and process them in our own way. And I think being open about that shouldn't affect our credibility in terms of our job and what we do. But it is that mindset that, oh, people are going to think that if I can't deal with my own life, how can I do the job that we're doing looking after someone else? And that isn't the mindset to have. It's so hard to get out of that. Yeah. It's sort of drilled into us all, isn't it, from the very beginning? It really is, yeah. But no, I think that's a really important message. You know, we're all human. Communication is absolutely key. And, you know, we'd all be there for each other regardless. So, exactly. And your boss is supposed to be one of the closest people that you've got to you, especially when you go into work. So it's about making sure that you use that relationship for good yeah, and for the support that you need. Exactly. But if we're talking about, you know, really big life changes and because we've both said, you know, everybody goes through them and that's yeah. really important for everyone to remember. However successful and happy someone looks like on the outside, you never know what's going on no. underneath, ever. No. So what advice would you give to anyone struggling to adjust to a major life event and keep their head above water whilst also managing a successful career? I think this is such a hard one just because people process things so differently and deal with things in such different ways so aside from being honest with at least you know the key people you're working with and saying even if you don't feel like you can go into details just say look I'm going through something I need a bit of time this is what's happening just have a bit of patience with me I think you also just need to talk to someone even if it's you know a parent or just a close friend because there will be someone that's been through a similar situation or maybe they're going through that situation as well and you had no idea because as soon as you start talking to someone it's one of those problem shared as a problem halved I think you just feel so much better about it so I think if you keep it all to yourself that kind of inner critic in your head is just going to keep telling you you know oh you're doing dreadfully like you're just you're going to have a bad day today your problem's not as big as someone else's so yeah. don't tell them don't bother them that's a huge problem oh, exactly exactly mine in my head is always like oh you're just moaning like you're just whining about things that like you're being ridiculous like even if it's you know oh i need to go and move all my stuff out of my flat like in my head it was oh yeah but like you know you're making it such a mountain out of a molehill like it's literally just boxing some things up and moving them like why are you taking so long to go and do that, to go and do it? But all those kind of things are hard. And it's not just the, it was locked down. How do you go to your flat and pick up stuff? You know, the practical side of things. It's also the emotional side of dealing with all of that and processing all of it. But if you talk to someone, they can actually say to you, no, what you're going through is really difficult. Like, I'm impressed that like you're still managing like you're up you're doing things you're being productive you're brushing your teeth exactly you've put clothes on today like that is such (laughs) a good step like well done and they can just you know give you that bit of nudging forward that you might need and then it might think actually yeah I I did brush my teeth today I I can send that email I can schedule this meeting at work like it could just I think helps you get through kind of the day-to-day And also, I think it's so key to not think too far ahead in the future. You know, I, over the last couple of months, have really just tried to take it day by day. And, you know, if I've woken up and it's, I'm feeling all right, I'm going to have an all right day today, that's fine. Next day could be the complete opposite and you can barely get out of bed. Again, that's fine. Whereas if you think, oh God, like, what am I going to do? And over Christmas, like, that's going to be a really difficult time. Like, if you dwell on that too much, I think you'll just pull yourself back in and it'll be much harder to kind of just move on and go through the process. Whereas if you take it just kind of small steps at a time, you know, right, I've logged on a few minutes early, that's fine. Like, I've gone through my emails, I know what I need to do today. You know, be in the present, be in that moment. I think that makes it at least for me, I assume this will help some other people. I think that makes it a lot easier. Yeah, setting expectations, isn't it? Your yeah. personal expectations. And if you think about the 
two of the really key skills to, that you need to be a really good PA. One, you need to be a good listener. And two, yeah. you do need to be good at prioritising and setting expectations. So I found it really useful having you guys to really lean on when I was going through it. And as PAs, you are just natural born listeners. So yeah. I was just able to completely download everything on you <laughs> and just talk and, and not feel like I was going to be judged. I didn't feel like I was going to be a burden. And that's what you need sometimes. And then, yeah, setting your own expectations, you know, celebrating the really small things oh, and, and knowing that it's not going to be easy the whole time. But if you've got that support network, whether that's, you know, and I mean, well, no, we all have different support networks, don't we? So if you're yeah, going through do. a bad time, you're boss is your support network at work you might have a, a couple of PA friends at work who you can really lean on yeah. to say look can you help me with this or can you help me with that or can you kind of just you know sort something out for me because I'm not feeling great today and then you've got your friends and then yeah. if you need to go and see a therapist as well exactly. if you're going through a really bad time mental health is no longer as much of a taboo subject as it was before not and at everybody all. needs a bit of time I think to blow off steam I personally think everyone should go to therapy regardless every six months because there's something that annoys or upsets all of us oh yeah definitely so I did speak to a counsellor kind of mid during this period of time I'd been I've been okay I'd been just kind of like a you know duck where it's like it always will calm on the surface but it's legs are you know really <laughs> yeah. kicking really hard and I was sat on this virtual kind of review meeting that we was going on and I just suddenly thought nope I just can't do my job. I can't just carry it. I just can't. So I did end up speaking to a counsellor through work and they were so good just in terms of speaking to someone removed from the situation. Yeah. They weren't coming into the conversation with any bias or judgment. I like, mm. didn't know any, they didn't know me. They didn't know the other person involved. There was nothing that they were bringing to the table other than they listened and they said all the things I needed to hear. You know, I'm not being ridiculous. I'm not yeah. just being irrational which was just so good to hear and it really like kind of bolstered me up for quite a while so yeah 100% agree with you that you know sometimes that's what you need you need to talk to some like a professional about these things and yeah. it's not a case of oh you know like oh, I'm having a bad time like so I'll speak to a therapist and not tell anyone I think that's still quite a taboo and I don't think people should feel bad if that's what you need to do that's what you need to do. And only positive things, I think, can come out of it. Like maybe it will open some other avenues to you in terms of other things you need to work on. But if that's self-development, that's only ever a good thing and yeah. going to help you in the future. Yeah, and, and you learn all sorts in therapy. You um, learn p coping yeah. mechanisms. You learn lots about yourself. You're able to reflect back and think, okay, if that happens again, I'm going to be able to do this going forward. And maybe yeah. I'll be able to, you know, handle things a bit differently. And, and maybe the outcome will be a bit different next time. I mean, I think life happens, doesn't it? It does. Especially right now. And there's going to be a lot of people going through a lot of trauma at this yeah. time. I spoke to one of my really good friends, Abigail Barnes, recently, who yeah. um, people listening to this podcast might recognise her name. She's a she's a trainer. She has an amazing 888 formula and she's awesome at what she does. And she described everyone that she had been working with recently as traumatised. And I think that's the best way to describe us. Yeah. None of us are going to come out of COVID-19 in the same way that we entered COVID-19. No, not at all. And it's about knowing that there's always support there. It doesn't matter what you're going through. It doesn't matter if you think the person next to you is going through something more serious than you. Everything is relative. And as you said, exactly. your inner critic is always going to tell you that, you know, you're being silly or just get yeah. over it. And I think the best way that I can describe how, you know, I've sort of felt through COVID and, and through my own breakup, and it's something that my therapist said to me, and I love this quote, whatever happens to you in life, if it's not what you expect is, and if something goes terribly wrong, it's not about getting over it, it's about getting through it. I love that so much. That's so good. Like a motto to have. That's yeah. Like such a good mantra to think about it. Because you are, you're, you're going through it and yeah. we're going through this process and it's going through each stage of whatever you're going through it's not just a oh come on get over it it is a go through it work through the motions and sit with it and work through how it's making you feel and how you will get through that brilliant well looking forward what does the future hold for Karina DeBorn you know what if you had asked me this maybe even like four months ago I would have just kind of shot you down and been like I have no idea I could 
can't even think about like the next four hours, let alone any sort of future. But I feel like now we're in the second half of 2020. It's got a bit of time to redeem itself. I feel like there is a bit of light at the end of the tunnel. So in terms of kind of career and that kind of thing, there's a few things at FTI that I'm working on. I'd like to push through like the EA development program, I'm getting really involved with their charity side of things and building out their diversity and inclusion practice within the bit that I mm-hmm. work in, which is something that we really need to work on as a company as a whole. So there's those kind of few things, kind of irons in the fire, I would say. But I think my big focus is just putting me first. I think I spent a lot of the last couple of years putting other people first and kind of their happiness and what they wanted before mine and just kind of going along with that and thinking, oh, well, if they're happy, I'll be happy. I think actually I've learned from this kind of last six months, that's not always the case. Like, yes, you can be happy if you're making others happy. But if you're not happy in yourself with what you're doing and doing things for yourself, it is going to catch up to you. So I just really want to kind of still sit with myself and think, actually, what what do I want to do in the next couple of years? Where do I see my life going? And what is going to make me happier? So one of the things that I've started doing over the last couple of months is my own kind of calligraphy and print watercolour kind of side hustle, I would say, which is something that I wanted to do for a long time. Give a shout out to your Instagram. Calligraphy by KDB. There we go. Thank you. Thank you. (laughs) (laughs) It's something I wanted to do for a long time, but just thought, oh, like, what's the point? That inner critic again, like, oh, there's loads of people doing the same thing. Like, oh, I've what's not got di- time. Or... Yeah, like, well, no one's going to want that. Or yeah. what's different about you? You know, why is anyone going to be interested? But I just shut it down and thought, you know what? Now is the time to do things we really enjoy and that we can be passionate about. So doing more creative things for myself, you know, you get lost in the moment. Like, you're just happy. You're not even aware of time, all things like that. I think have really helped me over the last couple of months. So pushing that forward, I think, is going to be something I'm really keen to do, which I'm I'm excited about. Yeah, and not putting yourself under any pressure either. Going with the flow. Exactly. Going through it. Working through it. Working through it, not (laughs) getting over it. Exactly, exactly. We recently did, uh, I mean, obviously at the assistant room, we have a really great campaign called Colleagues Unite, and it's where we're focusing on minority groups and understanding how we can support those people and kind of raise their profile within our own organisations. And we recently put something out, didn't we, about the calligraphy, because FDI were supporting a cause that you wanted to be part of, weren't they? Yes, yes. So they've actually got really good in the last, probably over the last year or so, supporting more kind of smaller charities and organisations that you might not necessarily have heard of unless you're really interested in those areas. So one that I feel really needs a good shout out is called Stopwatch. So they're a charity that works on preventing people being stopped for kind of no apparent reason because they think they're carrying weapons or knives or anything like that. Facial profiling, basically, isn't it? Yeah, exactly. And a lot of the stories from this charity are that there was literally nothing about these individuals that would lead you to think otherwise. It was just exactly as you said, racial profiling, which I cannot believe still is a big thing at the moment in the world that we live in. I think it's just, I just don't have any words for these kind of things. I really don't. So it's working on kind of raising money to help prevent this happening, but also helping people that are, you know, maybe from more disadvantaged backgrounds to really kind of push them more into kind of a good career path or, you know, getting better hobbies and like that kind of thing and just giving them kind of a nudge in the right direction. I would say. Yeah, and FTI really supported that initiative, didn't they? I know that you were doing it by yourself and we put a newsletter out in support saying that you were creating your own calligraphy cards Yeah, and FTI were going to match the donation that you had for those cards, which is absolutely amazing. As a company, FTI is so good on that kind of thing and they're so good with if someone wants to do something for a charity they will help you in whatever way they can. You know, they're really keen on their CSR and I'm saying this with the caveat that they're not just doing it so that they're seen to be good at doing it. You know, there's so many people there in the business that really care, so involved and just have so much to give, which is so nice to be working for a company that 
does want to be involved and will support you on an individual basis, push forward, things yeah. like that. And it's not just a bit of paper that they have flying no, around yeah, as a policy. Exactly. And then, because I think so many businesses do that, don't they? They kind yeah. of tick the box and they say, right, we need a policy for X, Y, Z. Yeah. And especially when it comes to diversity and inclusion, that generally isn't something you would even notice or, or see unless you actually looked for it. Oh, yeah. So it's nice to, to be... From my perspective, hearing what you're saying about FTI, it's nice to see that they're actually walking the walk. Yeah, they are. I mean, it's taken them a bit of time. I think it's safe to say that. But, yeah, they want to walk the walk. They want to talk the talk. They want to do the best that they can be doing. They know they haven't always been doing that, but they've seen, actually, now we do need to make that change. Like Maybe we've been dragging our feet a bit, but now we have no excuse to not make that change and really push for it, which is really good. (laughs) 